of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Amen. What is the kingdom of God? We pray that God's kingdom would come every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, but what does that actually mean? Thankfully, the kingdom of God doesn't look like any of the kingdoms of this world. But, and this may be disappointing to some, the kingdom of God is considerably less impressive than those worldly kingdoms. At least that's how Jesus lays it out for us today in our two parables. First, the kingdom of God is like a farmer who doesn't know how to farm. And second, the kingdom of God is like a garden plant. Pretty disappointing, right? But that's what Jesus is doing to us here in this season after Pentecost. He's disappointing us by dashing our unchallenged and often unbiblical understandings of who he is and who we are as subjects of his kingdom. But we don't take it well when Jesus corrects us. So he teaches us in parables. He uses parable, and the word parable means to throw alongside, which means that parables teach us indirectly. We can't take the full truth at once, so Jesus takes his teaching and throws it alongside an earthly example. And so today, the kingdom of God, Jesus takes and throws along two rather unimpressive earthly examples to show us how he establishes his kingdom and how it exists in the world. So first, Jesus teaches that the kingdom of God is like a farmer planting his field. The trouble is, God isn't exactly the best of farmers. He doesn't do anything any experienced worker of the ground would do. He doesn't plow the soil. He doesn't measure the seed. He doesn't fertilize. He doesn't apply any pesticides. He just grabs the bag of seed, walks out of the barn, and tosses it on the ground. Then he goes about his business. And by some miracle, the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces automatically by itself. First the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. And then everything is ready for the harvest. Now, anyone with a bit of experience would tell you this is not how you maximize your yields. You would think that God would do everything he can to cause the kingdom to grow as big as possible. Surely he'd have the latest technology, the best equipment, and the smartest and most efficient workers. But God's not worried about that. He doesn't concern himself with best practices, efficiency, and maximizing growth. And why would this be? This is because the seed that God spreads does everything by itself. On its own, the seed contains everything it needs to flourish to the fullest. It's resistant to drought and disease. It can grow in any soil, and it overpowers any weeds and pests. In fact, it often thrives in those conditions. God's seed doesn't need any extra attention. The seed plants itself and produces fruits completely by itself. Now, the seed is Christ and his word. I say both Christ and his word because you can't separate the two. God doesn't just spread any old word to the winds. He spreads the word that is the proclamation of Christ and him crucified. Christ is the grain of wheat that falls into the earth and dies, and because it dies, it bears much fruit. That's the message of all of scripture. And that's the message that plants faith in the heart of believers who then grow up into a glorious kingdom. Just as Christ was planted in the tomb and burst forth to unending life, so also will we grow by our death into eternal life. But to hearts and minds overburdened by a culture of abundance, this whole process seems slow, inefficient, and not productive enough. So we're tempted to insert ourselves into God's task of cultivating. Thing is, we're not the best of farmers either because we don't trust the seed to do its work. We end up over applying the pesticides, putting on too much fertilizer and digging where we're not supposed to. Now that doesn't mean God won't use us as his workers on his holy farm. He does. But it's by serving faithfully in our vocations, quietly committed to our tasks, that God plants the seed, the seed of the gospel that will sprout 
in his time. It takes patience and trust in the divine farmer to know that his seed will on its own create the abundance for his kingdom. In the end, however, we make better dirt than farmers when it comes to the kingdom of God. Or to shift the imagery a little bit to the imagery of the second parable, we make much better birds than plants. In other words, we're better off simply receiving the life-giving and life-protecting power of the kingdom than trying to manipulate the kingdom according to our plans. In this second parable, the kingdom of God is compared to a mustard seed. It's the smallest of all the seeds on earth, says Jesus, but it grows up and becomes the largest of all the garden plants, which sounds great, except when you realize that the mustard plant is just a short, scrubby bush in the garden. What about those lofty cedars that Ezekiel talks about, big and noble, covering the mountain height of Israel? Isn't that a better image for the kingdom? Perhaps. But I think there's something to be gained by seeing the kingdom as a small, unassuming, but active refuge in one corner of the garden. And this, I think, is what connects the second parable with the first. We learn that the kingdom of God isn't big and loud and fast and busy and imposing. Instead, it works in quiet, slow, and local ways. The seed in the first parable was planted and did all the work silently by itself underground. And the mustard seed in the second was planted and grew up into a short-reaching garden shrub that served only its part of the garden. So while the world sees only a tiny seed growing into a scruffy, useless garden shrub, we see the kingdom of God. Because hidden in that garden shrub is the birds, safely nesting in its shade. And that's you. Birds dwelling safely in the branches of God's kingdom. It's here that he gives your tired wings rest. Here he protects you from the snare of the fowler. Here in this unassuming shrub, he feeds you with the bird seed of his word and the fruits of his cross. Here at Messiah, we are the mustard plant in the garden of Germantown, offering a place of refuge from the perilous powers of sin and death. And by the way, did you know that the seeds of the must or the berries of the mustard plant were once used to heal snake bites? And that throws us back to that first garden, where we can see all of these truths with a little more clarity. We really are nothing more than a bunch of dirt, formed by the very hands of God who breathed life into us and planted his word in our hearts. But then the good gardener's careful work was corrupted. We were tempted by the serpent, and with our first parents we fell into sin. But planted in Eve, was the promise of a seed, a son, who would, on the tree of the cross, crush the serpent's head and heal all of us who are suffering from the poisonous bite of sin. Now all of us birds are making our nest in his kingdom. Rather than flitting around and seeking a nest among the kingdoms of the world, we perch ourselves on the tree of the cross, which is the center of the kingdom of God, the son of God's own throne. For it's there that he established his kingdom, and it's there that he sustains it. To the eyes of the world, it's not impressive. But to us, people of the dirt and birds of the air, it's a source of life now and in eternity. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. Amen.